when things are at a euphoria, you know, that's the time to go against the crowd itself. When things are absolutely rock bottom and, and, and everybody's crying woes and the world's going to end and, and everything's down or everything's bumping along the bottom, that's when to, to just back up the rock and buy. My slogan has always been in resources, either you are a contrarian or you will become a victim. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have two returning guests today, Rick Rule, the CEO of Rule Investment Media, and we also have Ross Beatty. He was the founder and chairman of Pan American Silver, retired from that, now the current chairman of Equinox Gold. Ross and Rick, thank you very much for joining us again here on Liberty and Finance this Tuesday, June 22nd, 2021. Pleasure to be with you, Dunnigan. We wanted to get a chance to field some viewers' questions that have been submitted ahead of your interview with you, gentlemen, and also to mention the upcoming 2021 Natural Resource Symposium that we want to make sure everybody has information on so they don't miss that. Uh, first of all, the uh, questions are interesting that have been submitted this time. There's actually three of them from three different uh, questioners asking about a fairly unconventional, or I guess you could look at it the other way, it's probably one of the most conventional resource that anybody deals with, and that's water. Uh, we have a, a question from Jack Bradford saying, question for our guests, are there any water resource stocks worth a look? Thanks for your consideration. Another question from Dr. Dog Will Hunt, how will the drought affect mining? And another one asking uh, also about water rights and water resources. Uh, Rick, could you kick us off with that and uh, and let us know? And then and then Ross, you can let, let us know how it affects mining. Yeah, I think I think I'll I'll, I'll probably take I'll probably take questions one and three, and uh, Ross can talk about the mining applications given that he's active in some fairly dry areas. Uh, in terms of uh, water stocks for U.S. investors. There's probably two that investors could look at with a straight face, both of which are actually farming companies. J.G. Boswell is one of the largest private landowners in the state of California and may well be the largest private water rights owner in the state of California. It's uh, tough to trade because it never came public. It trades on the pink sheets, being a family-controlled company that's 120 years old. The symbol is B-W-E-L. Uh, once again, it's a farming and land development company that's indirectly a water rights play, given that they are, as a consequence of their farming operations, probably the largest water rights owner in the state of California. The second is another farming play, uh, Limonera, L-M, uh, I don't even know the symbol anymore, uh, L-M-N-A, I think, uh, trades on NASDAQ. The company is a citrus and avocado producer, and the holder fee simple of 2,200 acres of land in Santa Paula, California, where they uh, both grow uh, citrus and avocados, but are also involved in the land development business. They are probably easily the largest water rights owner in Ventura County, which for those of your listeners who don't know, is suburban Los Angeles, uh, an area with really rapid growth and development. And Ross, perhaps you can talk about water in mining. Sure. Uh, well, water in mining is, is a significant issue, uh, and uh, with the drought in the southwest uh, U.S., it's just another, uh, I guess, another uh, ref reflection of the fact that we have to look after our water. And this is not just a mining problem. The fact is, uh, uh, you know, America and, and much of the world has been depleting aquifers for, for forever, for, for decades. And, and it's, a, it's a real problem. But necessity is the mother of invention. And I think uh, the problem will be resolved simply by better allocation, better use of water that exists. And this is something that will happen in the U.S. It's, it's happening in places like Brazil and Mexico already. Uh, mine is is a significant use uh, user of water, but again, like like everything, if you have a crisis and if if the value of the cost of that water goes up, companies are pretty resourceful in finding solutions to use less water, minimize their costs, do what they can, and uh, so I don't think there's a real crisis now, uh, but uh, but. Uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a wake up call that we have to use our water differently, and and that really speaks to everybody, 
uh, municipalities, um, and and all industrial operations. Ross, am I not correct in saying that uh, mining is a fairly sustainable activity in the sense of uh, economic output generated relative to things like land use and water use? I compare, as an example, your mine in Imperial County, California, uh, your gold mine, which is probably a fairly substantial user, uh, as against, uh, as an example, using 12 acre feet of water a year in a desert to grow alfalfa. Um, uh, sure. I, mean, I, don't know what a, I don't know what an alfalfa crop produces rec- per, per hectare or per acre, but uh, yeah. I can tell you, our, our, you know, that one mine you speak about produces 150,000 ounces a year, give or take. That's about a $300 million revenue base on an area of maybe 100 uh, or maybe... I was going to say hectares, say say uh, say a thousand or a couple thousand acres. I mean, it's a you're right. It's an extremely wealth generating uh, uh, revenue base, a re- wealth generating resource utilization per per acre, and uh, and per acre of of water use. I guess it's pretty minimal compared to a, a good a good alfalfa farm. I mean, one would suspect that if uh, water ran downhill to money, which is to say utility, if there was a market in water. <laughs> Rather than uphill to votes, the alfalfa guy wouldn't be the high bid. The gold miner would be. Does that strike you as being likely? I think so. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of eyes on the silver market, the silver inventory, the silver exchanges, both the COMEX and the LBMA. Uh, the silver squeeze has been in the news. I know, Rick, you addressed it with your Robin Hood Reddit and the Rise of the Retail Investor, wonderfully named seminar uh, a little while ago. And we've had, and we are going to have again uh, later this week, uh, Wall Street Silver uh, guys on our channel for an interview, finding out about the activity of retail investors. So there's lots of eyes on the silver market, lots of concerns about things that might change the dynamics, change the game in the silver market. There's one question here from Jeff Barber for both you gentlemen. What would you please ask Ross and Rick what the impact they see from Basel III having on the silver market? Do you want to try that first, Rick? Uh, I'm happy to. Uh, I I think the idea that physical precious metals uh, and the proposal, I think, is both gold and silver uh, being included in some circumstances or continued in other circumstances as tier one assets, uh, which is to say assets that if you loan against them, you don't need to reserve against, uh, is an important thing. Uh, I don't believe that the Bank for International Settlements or the central banks around the world will change too much the rules around hypothecated uh, precious metals as collateral because I don't think that the Bank for International Settlements believes that it's in their interest to do anything that would be detrimental to the balance sheets of the large uh, money market banks in the world. The idea that the implementation of the Basel III Accords uh, with regards to uh, hypothecated metals uh, and metals derivatives uh, would create some sort of short squeeze in precious metals, uh, I think is a fantasy. Uh, in a political process, and certainly regulating exchanges and regulating banks is a political process, uh, the banks understand the game of politics, and I don't think that anything will occur that would be deleterious to the interests of the big banks. Yeah, I can't really uh, add anything to that. That was that was a, a perfect discussion, I think. No worries. And uh, we have a question also from another viewer about turning to our the silver mining and related stocks that people are interested in uh, for trying to participate in what they perceive will be an ongoing bull market in metals over the next several years. Uh, there is a question both about uh, purchasing and about selling. I cried today asks, it is said that there are scant few geniuses who know when to buy a stock, but nobody, no one, regardless of how smart, knows when to sell. Do you two agree or disagree with this statement and why? <laughs> Maybe I'll take tackle that one for a strike. Uh, I would say it's, 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 a, it's a hell of a challenge to actually make the decision when to buy, not just when to sell. It's kind of the same, uh, it's the same coin, just different sides of the same coin. Um, you know, every trade, you're either a genius or a fool. And, uh, um, you know, take your pick. Uh, if if in hindsight the uh, stock goes up and you make money, you're the genius. But uh, you know, almost the same time, you, you could be the, the fool. 
So um, I think uh, there is, uh, you know, you can make careful analysis of markets and you can make a pretty well-educated decision on when to buy. And by the same token, you can make a pretty well-educated decision on when to sell. Um, and it's it's very strange. One of the things you can do is go against um, your emotions because uh, we all know that, uh, you know, the notion of madness, of, you know, madness of crowds, popular delusions of the madness of crowds, people tend to be herd like thinking. And, and this, is what, this is what causes causes bull markets and bear markets. And and uh, and when things are at a uh, euphoria, you know, that's the time to go against the crowd to sell. When things are absolutely rock bottom and, and, and everybody's crying woes and, and, a, and a, you know, the world's going to end and, and everything's down or everything's bumping along the bottom, that's when to, to just back up the truck and buy. So it's hard to do, but it's 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 the right thing to do. And, and I mean, you take a great investor like Rick, he's, he's done this all his life. And most of the time, it's been pretty successful. Wouldn't you agree, Rick? Yeah, I mean, thank you for the compliment. Uh, I, I would say uh, yourself, Ross. You uh, you decided to build a silver mining company when silver was at four or five dollars an ounce, uh, unsustainably low. You decided to buy to build a copper company when copper was priced at eighty five cents a pound, unsustainably low. You deploy money when the sector you're deploying in is unpopular. If you're an investor, as a trader, that's very different. Uh, I don't have a trader's mentality particularly. I like to buy things when they're out of favor. I like to sell things when they're in favor. I normally buy too early. Depending on who the manager is, I tend to sell too early too. Uh, I've learned with better managers, the right thing to do is buy a lot when I can and then relax uh, and let them sell the whole company uh, over time. But I I really agree with you, Ross. I suspect that the person who asked the question uh, is or fancies himself or herself a trader. Uh, trying to do things like time the market uh, and outthink people who spend 50 or 60 hours a week at it, which I think is very difficult. I think that uh, resource-based businesses are capital intensive. I think that they're cyclical. I continue to believe that most people would be better off owning larger positions and fewer resource stocks, uh, buying when that sector, be it the commodity or the country, was out of favor and selling when it returned to favor. My slogan has always been in resources, either you are a contrarian or you will become a victim. <laughs> we have a uh, very specific question that I think might be exciting for you, gents, and for our listeners. Jan Marcus says, is there a project in the gold and silver space that you think has a good chance at becoming a world-class discovery? Or I could, you could broaden that out beyond discovery and just say a world-class development or asset. I will uh, hand off Ross uh, one of the best slow pitches of his career. I would suggest that within Pan American Silver, there are two different tier one assets, neither of which are currently in production, both of which uh, are tier one deposits. So, Ross, given that the the questioner gave you such an amazing softball, perhaps (laughs) you could talk about the two assets that I'm referring to within Pan American, which you know well. Thanks, Rick. Uh, and and I mean, I was going to talk about other a uh, few other companies that, that come to mind with that question. Um, but um, but we actually do have something in house, I guess, in, in Pan American Silver that that you know Rick's referring to. We have an asset in Argentina that's literally it's five five hundred million ounces to a billion ounces, right on the surface, uh, f- fully defined, feasibility studies done. But there's a social problem in that in that province. They they won't allow mining. So we've been holding on to the project for 10 years, waiting patiently for them to, um, you know, realize that this is going to generate, you know, $500 million a year in revenue, most of which stays in the in the province. And, and it does almost no damage whatsoever to the environment because it's in a very uh, benign area uh, with almost no vegetation, uh, just a sort of a high desert in southern Argentina. So um, it's been a puzzle that that hasn't happened, but there's a lot of anti-mining, very rabid uh, uh People who have so far managed to convince the government that it's not a good thing to permit a uh, mine, while at the same time they use they use products of mining every single minute of their lives, <laughs> uh, and so that's one. Uh, we hope that you know it could be any any month, it could be any year, but it, we think it will be eventually permitted, and that's that's capable of producing almost as much silver as Pan American produces today from from ten different mines. So it's a real home run asset 
if has and when it's it's permitted. And then there's another one in Guatemala that we acquired when we bought a, a gold mining company a, a couple of years ago uh, called called Escobal. And the same thing, Escobal was an operating mine, one of the biggest in the world, and a high grade, uh, very very large, huge exploration potential, very low cost. You know, a real generator of wealth for again for literally thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, the the mine was shut down when the government uh, uh, constitutional court said that the company hadn't consulted with the uh, indigenous population in the area uh, properly, and we bought it at a kind of a fire sale price, uh, and we're still negotiating right now with the indigenous population with the government trying and they're negotiating they're trying to consult with the indigenous population to get kind of the social license to get the mine running again. Once again, I, I think uh, the, this mine is, has a very long life. Uh, we're going to be very patient and try to do the right thing with, with, with all stakeholders. And it's very much in the hands of the government right now, but we think uh, that logic will triumph in the end, and this will become back uh, back at, into operation as, as one of the world's biggest silver mines. So between those two you know, world-class assets, tier one assets, Pan American will, will go from what is today the second largest silver mining company in the world to what will be the largest and, and uh, almost triple its production base. It's pretty, those are pretty amazing assets. There are other ones as well. I don't know, Los, Los Filos, uh, Los, Los Filos, sorry, uh, Filo Mining, pardon me, Filo Mining uh, just made a really incredible discovery in, uh, in, um, the Andes uh, of a copper deposit. It's 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 got world class written all over it. Uh, there's a few gold deposits in, in Canada that have had some really astounding uh, exploration results recently. So you know there are some out there, but every one of these has has risk around it in in every way: the exploration risk, and then ultimately mining risk and social risk, environmental risk. So just because there's a there's a, a few good holes and things look like they're world class. You know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to confirm that. The uh, other thing that's coming to mind is the upcoming 2021 Natural Resource Symposium. I understand, Ross, you're going to be there. Uh, we don't ask you to divulge uh, what you're going to be talking about, but just from a thematic standpoint, uh, if you could give people at least an understanding or an inkling of what w they can look forward to uh, from your and from your experience in the past, other uh, presenters that they're likely to see at the at the National Resource Symposium. Maybe I'll start, Rick, and you can you can carry carry on. I'm going to talk about uh, gold. Actually, it's it sounds kind of uh, like you know trying to be a little different if you're uh, Elizabeth Taylor's uh, seventh husband or eighth husband. <laughs> um, it's it's not the simplest thing to to a, to a to an audience that really understands gold like these speculative investors do that will come to the Sprout conference. Uh, you know these are these are specialist investors by and large. They they understand the gold. Uh, fundamental base and and i guess i'm going to try to just explain from a personal standpoint why after you know running public companies for um for 35 years or 30 30 35 years or so why my last company I, i'm calling it my last dance is uh is equinox gold and why it is a pure uh, gold company that we're going to try to build into one of the world's biggest and 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 most leveraged to gold. Why I'm doing that in 2021? That's why I'm talking. That's what I'm going to be talking about. And Rick, uh, more about the conference and what people can look forward to there. Well, one of my favorite features in the conference Ross is involved in. Uh, for about 20 years, uh, I have corralled uh, entrepreneurs like Ross, including Ross, who have built multi-billion-dollar companies. Uh, from penny bases, uh, taken stocks from 50 cents a share to $40 a share. Uh, and I've done it not just to showcase the case the company, certainly to showcase the companies too, but more importantly to extricate from the people who built these companies how they did it, uh, why they succeeded when most people failed, what lessons they learned building these companies, uh, how the lessons that they learned building the companies made them better investors in natural resources, and what lessons might be transferable and applicable to our attendees. We call this the living legends, and this year I'm delighted to say that we have uh, Ross Beatty, we have uh, Robert Friedland, uh, we have Randy Smallwood, Sean Rosen, Rob McEwen. We have a great group of people who have built multi-billion dollar companies from scratch, uh, people who we have had at the conference in prior years who finished in the top quartile in terms of uh, attendee satisfaction. So people who not only have uh, done the work, 
but can also explain how the work was done to the benefit of investors. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited, too, to hear Ross talk about gold. I have my own opinions as to gold. But I've watched Ross for many years start a silver company when silver was out of favor, uh, deploying capital when it was unpopular. Uh, I watched him, as I say, move into the copper business with Lumina Copper when copper was out of favor, which was a tremendous financial home run for me. So I'm interested in hearing him and his take on one of my favorite topics in the world, which is gold. You will be able to also, folks, meet uh, myself and my sons who are on my Liberty and Finance team in the Miles Franklin exhibitor booth who are also going to be participating in the conference. You can meet face-to-face that way. And uh, Rick, in the past, you've given people a, uh, I think, a a hard-to-pass-up offer if they attend the conference. Uh, Two offers, frankly, uh, Donegan. The first is the normal rankings offer. Any of your listeners or subscribers who care what I think about their natural resource portfolio can find out. No obligation. For free. Uh, Email, well, go to a website, sproutusa.com forward slash rankings. Enter your natural resource stocks. I'll rank them, one to ten, one being best, ten being worst, and comment on individual issues where I think that my comments might have value. With regards to the conference, uh, I, I think we're the only investor conference in the world that has an ironclad money-back guarantee. If you decide that you would like to come to our conference, pay the entry fee, virtual entry fee, uh, and for any reason that you don't think that you got your money's worth, uh, email me and I'll give you 100% of your money back. Uh, I I don't think that you'll have to do that, which is why I make the offer uh, with such complete confidence, but absolutely the financial risk is mine. Uh, also want to make sure that we get a chance, Ross, for you to let people know how they can find out more about either Pan American Silver or Equinox Gold. Well, they're, they're public companies. It's pretty easy to <laughs> find information out about them. Just Google PanAmericanSilver.com or EquinoxGold.com and you'll you'll get right into the website. And it's a very they're both very good websites. They tell, they'll tell you everything you want to know and probably a lot more about what the <laughs> companies are all about. Well, we really appreciate your presence here both. There's one little uh, oddball question I'm going to toss out there just for fun at the end. Uh, Jan Marcus asks each of you, what cars do you drive? (laughs) (laughs) I'm a pathological cheapskate. Uh, I have a, it's the uh, Toyota RAV4 and a Toyota Highlander. So uh, vehicles that are suited to my lifestyle, which is to say rural and cheap. <laughs> you mentioned you like hiking, so I bet those get you where you need to get to to get to the trailheads, yeah. They do. Well, I, I, uh, I, I have, uh, my wife and I have, have three cars, uh, and, and we use them all about the same amount. She drives a, a, she drives a Nissan Leaf, a 100% electric car. I drive an Audi e-tron which is a 100 percent electric car and we love them both they're fantastic cars and uh, but the the car we use is the workhorse we live on a on a large piece of property the big garden and i'm always hauling soil and manure and all kinds of stuff we have an old 2002 uh, honda odyssey van which we use as a pickup truck and it's just an incredible vehicle never dies and uh, we still have it it's just it's just wonderful. I, I'm using it today to do a big haul of uh, groceries for a wedding we're having on on the week this weekend at our place here on on our island, and uh, yeah, it, it's 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 an extremely well made car and, and never dies. Nice. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here again on Liberty and Finance. On behalf of our all of our audience, I just thank you both for coming along. Thank Bye. you, Dunnigan. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. 